Once again, good afternoon, investors. Welcome to a journey that's bound to unlock the secrets of successful trading. We are thrilled to have you all here with us today at the first installment of our Technical Analysis 101 from Charts to Profits, where we will discuss how you can start trading in the Philippine market. Today, we'll begin the first part of our series from Charts to Profits. So by the end of this session, your watch list won't just be a list. It'll be your strategic guide to the market. So grab your pens, your note, open your notepads, and get ready to absorb some invaluable knowledge. Also, please keep your microphones muted during the entire session. If you have any questions, drop them in the chat box or in the comment section so that we can answer them later in the Q&A section. So without any further ado, let's jump right into it. Our speaker for today is Jared Din, my fellow Dragonfire researcher. Ja Jared was a financial economics and finance major at DLSU. He was the former executive vice president for investment analysis at DLSU's Investor Society, and second in the Investigram's 2021 Trading Cup. He currently trades in the Philippines and U.S. Take it away, Jared. So good day, everyone. So happy to have you all. So today we will delve into the first step into trading, which is in your watch list and your trade plan. So let's get on right with it. So first, you know, a lot of people want to get into trading, but there's a lot of things that hold them back. So these are among things that hold people back. So first is that you don't want to lose big, right? So you get into trading, you think that, you know, you're going to shoot for the stars, you're going to earn a lot of money. But at the same time, you can also lose a lot, right? If you wrong stocks, if you enter at the wrong time. So that's something that can hold you back. Next is what price should I buy, right? So prices go up and down, right? That's that's the nature of the market. So which of those prices should you buy, right? And at the same time, at what should you sell, right? So those are two very important things in when it comes to trading. Next is the magaling sa numbers, eh? So a lot of people think that trading is just full of numbers. If you're good in numbers, if you're not good in math, like trading's not for you. So that's really not true, and I'll show you why. <laughs> Next is the most, I think this one's most common, is what stocks do I buy? So you open your brokerage account, and then you're like, so now what, right? There's like over 300 stocks in the PSE, close to 300. And how do you pick which one of those 300 to trade, right? There's so many stocks. So how do you do that? Next is, ang complicated naman ng mga charts, charts and all, right? So you see those candlestick charts. You see, what's this candle? Right? What's this volatility? What, why is it going up and down? Like, it's such a mess, right? And because of that, you're intimidated. And parang ayaw mo na, eh. parang ang complex naman eh. Parang complex. So that's another one. Then another one is, do I just buy what's hot, right? So if you just read the news, you see like, this stock is talked about, you know, you know, yun bibilhin ko, right? Yung, the stock that your kapit bahay says na, uy, maganda stock, bilhin mo. Are you gonna buy it immediately? So there's a lot of nuances to trading. And today we will be clarifying all that. So let's start. So first step is to craft your watch list. So first, let's define what your watch list is. So your watch list is your hit list. So these are the stocks that you will focus on. And these are the stocks with potential to move higher in the short term based on your analysis. So basically, there are almost 300 stocks in the PSE. Does that mean that you're going to watch all 300 of those stocks? The answer is no, right? Because do you have the time to monitor 300 stocks? Of course not, diba? So you have to narrow down, diba? So from 300, maha, you'll monitor mga 10, 20, maybe 5, diba? So something like that. You have to trim down from 300 stocks. You, you go even smaller, right? So that you can have focus on all those stocks. So those are your watch lists. So, so Jared, how do you normally create your watch lists? So, good question. So, that's where my next point comes. is, And that is, you have two prerequisites when you're going to craft your watch list. So, first, you have fundamental analysis and technical analysis. So, fundamental analysis, it looks at the financials. So, financials, is the company making money? Is it growing? Next is the news. Like, are there any good news about the stock, right? Is there... 
are they making awards or something like that? Are, are they posting record high profits? Do they have a new product? That's why they're in the news, something like that. Next is catalyst. So is there a certain trigger for the company to go up, right? Is there a certain event that directly or indirectly will affect the stock and will benefit and, and it will benefit from it, right? Next is growth drivers, right? So same thing, what's going to push the stock? So there must be a fundamental reason, either it's improving earnings, improving financials, or there's really that one news that will impact its trajectory moving forward. Next is technical analysis. So this is where I mostly do my, this is mostly where I find my watch list using technicals before fundamentals. Technicals looks at the charts. So basically you're looking at the price movement, right? So if it's going up, then, then you can recognize some trends, there were some, uh, some patterns within the price movement. So that's where I find my watch list. So here we have setting your entries, your stop loss and target price. So the point of this in crafting your watch list is that you're not just going to buy stocks that your neighbor tells you to do to buy, right? So the point here is you have to do your research. Always do your research on what you plan to buy, right? So if you should know what you're getting into. You should know what stock you're going to what the stock you're, you're planning to buy does as a business, right? So that's where it is. And in crafting your watch list using fundamental and technical analysis, here we have a light bulb. So basically, this is uh, idea generation. You're looking for that light bulb moment, and you're like, hmm, this is something good that maybe the stock price hasn't reflected on yet, right? So that is what we do when we're crafting our watch list. We look at fundamental analysis and technical analysis. But personally, I look at technical analysis first because that's already what's obvious. Then once I like the technicals, I would go on to look at the fundamentals and dig down deeper if there's really a reason why the stock should go up. So there. So now let's dig deeper on what fundamental analysis looks at. Okay, so fundamental analysis. So what do you look at when you conduct fundamental analysis? So you can look at the financials and all that, but I like to keep things simple. So I give myself some guide questions that I need to answer. And if I, have, if I cannot answer these four guide questions, that means I haven't done my fundamental analysis enough, right? So first is, what is the macro in, macroeconomic environment good for the company? So an example here is interest rates. So now that interest rates are so high and they're expected to have topped already and they're projected to go down sometime in the sometime during this year. So from that, I think to myself, what sectors will benefit from this macroeconomic environment? So since interest rates are expected to go down, for me, I think that it will be good for property companies, right? Since Property companies are one of the most sensitive to interest rate changes, right? So there. Then another example I can think of about interest rates, now that interest rates are in are very high and they're expected to have peak. So if you notice what stocks are going up right now, mostly they are there are those stocks are bank are in the banking sector. So you see your BDO, your Metro Bank, you're posting 52 week high. And the reason for that is because since interest rates are so high, banks can lend out uh, loans at very high interest rates. So how banks make money is they give out loans. And if interest rates are very high, then of course, they're going to make a lot more money, right? Because interest rates are that high. So next question is, is the company making more money? So you look at their financials. So are they making are they growing in revenue, right? Or are they increasing their margins? So what we mean by increasing their margins is um, 
you're spending less to make more money, right? So your expenses are kept minimal while you're making a lot more money, right? So that's what margins are. So if they're if your margins are increasing, that means you're being more efficient in your business, right? Next is turnaround in revenue. So just because a company is not really making money or its revenues are declining, does that mean it's already a bad company? Well, sometimes it depends. If you can see that there is a turnaround in revenue, so let's say from a company that's not making money at all, then suddenly the next year it's already making money or it's already break even, then there's something there, right? There's a turnaround in revenues from negative, it became break even, then it's now positive. So those are turnarounds and turnarounds in revenues. So, so that's something that could drive the stock price higher, right? Next are are there significant company developments? So examples are new products. So one example I can think of is let's say Figaro Coffee. So Figaro Coffee owns uh, Angel's Pizza, right? FCGs. So if uh, Angel's Pizza releases a new pizza product, let's say a new flavor, and people love that pizza, right? Like people just want to keep buying that pizza, then that's a, it's a hit, right? Then sales will go up, and that would attract a lot of attention, right? Because it will drive revenues up, and people love the product, right? So that's one significant company development, right? Next is acquisition of other companies. So if you can, if I can think of a recent example is there was a rumor that um, BMCI will acquire CHP or Semex, uh, which is a cement company, right? So that was a rumor. And as you see, you know, with that rumor, uh, Semex went, of a lot, right? So that's a significant company development, right? Next is a change in business model. So maybe uh, from a company that is not profitable, they completely change their business model into a profitable business model, right? So let's say they're doing, they're a miner, they're doing mining, but it comes to a point where companies are like, you know, mining's not really profitable for us. Let's go into the restaurant industry, right? So instead of mining, they change their business model to the restaurant and they're making, they're doing well in the restaurant business. So that could be a good catalyst for the stock to go up, right? Since it's a change in the business model. So that's another factor you can think of. Next is store expansion. So let's see, I, I can think of Jollibee, right? If you can see, there's a lot of Jollibee stores opening like locally and even abroad, right? So they just keep on increasing their number of stores. And that's really what's driving their growth, right? That's their store expansion. So these are things that you can really think about. Next is what are the risks in what are the risks in the short to medium term? So an example is the acquisition may not push through the bus. So you saw CHP, diba? It's just a rumor. Be not sure if matutuloy, diba? So that's a risk in the short term, right? The reward is matuloy. The risk is hindi matuloy, right? So something like that. Another risk is the new product is not hit, right? So if you go back to the Figaro example where Angel's Pizza, let's say they release a flavor and hindi patok, diba? Parang di na gusto yung flavor. And the, their sales will go down, right? So something like that. So that's a risk, really, right? Next is regulatory and political concerns. So, you know, when there are regulations, let's say one thing that I can, one example I can think of was, I think the sugar tax, when they, when they increase the taxes on sugary products, I think you saw URC, the junk food, like Mon, Mon Misin, you saw them, drop because that's their business, right? And when you increase their taxes, right, their profits decline. So something like that. Then you also have changing macro environment, of course, like sample interest rates change or competitors stealing market share. So let's say there's another pizza company that appears and people like them better than Angel's Pizza, then they're stealing their market shares, right? So that's a risk. So 
these are a lot of different face-to-face -face examples. So there's really no one systematic way to do fundamental analysis, right, Pramble? So it really depends on the type of company you're looking at. So you could ask different questions for different companies. But the point is, you have to keep asking yourselves, like, what does the company do? What, what can push it up, right? So you should have that mindset where what will drive this stock up? If you can't answer that, then you didn't do, then either it's, either you didn't do your fundamental analysis or there's just, you should just move on to the next stock, right? So what do you think about this, Uncle? Yeah, another also good way is um, approaching it on an in industry or sector-wide scale. So when you look at companies or analyze them fundamentally, it's good to compare them against their peers, their competitors, because that way you can identify which ones are the leaders, which ones are, are the laggards, and you can uh, have a better chance of picking out which um, company should be included into your watch list. Yes, exactly. So, so that basically, that's an overall, that's basically a plain picture of how we do fundamental analysis in a very simplified way. So now we go on to the next approach. So basically, um, just to summarize, when you do fundamental analysis, you're doing three things, three main things. You understand the business, right? So alam mo ano ginagawa ng business na yun, right? You know what you're getting yourself into, right? Then reasonable expectations, di ba? Di naman, just because you think na, uy, maganda yung company, di ba? Would you think na, ay, two times, three times na yung stock price, di ba? Parang, not really, right? You have to set, you have to be reasonable, di ba? So, okay, if it's growing 10%, then, okay, maybe stock price will go up. You know, tama lang. It's di naman double, right? So, you have to set your expectations. Talaga. So, next is technical analysis. So, this is my favorite part because this is really what I love to use. So, what is technical analysis? So, this is a study of using historical price data, price movements to predict future movements. So basically, here's an example naman. So let's say, gusto ko bumili ng apples, right? Apples, like here. And let's say, for example, gusto ko bilhin yung apple sa Friday, okay? I don't want to buy it uh, any other day. Gusto ko talaga Friday because that's when I'm going to the grocery, Friday pa. <laughs> But I don't know on the pressure ng apples, di ba? You don't know it. So do I just guess magkano yung apples on that day? Of course not, right? So what I would do is I'll look at the history ng price uh, the days before it. So let's say I have the data of magkano yung apples ng Monday to Thursday. So let's say in case one, apples ng Monday, 5 pesos. Tuesday, 5 pesos. Wednesday, 5 pesos. Thursday, 5 pesos. Franco, on Friday, how much kaya yun apples? I assume it's 5 pesos. Diba? <laughs> Kasi may pattern, right? Kasi nung Monday to Thursday, hindi nagbago yung pressure, right? It stayed the same. It's still at 5 pesos. So, I would assume na 5 pesos rin yun, yun apples on Friday. Next example, let's go to case 2. So, case 2 naman, ito yung data. Nung Monday, 5. Tuesday, 4. Wednesday, 3. Thursday, 2. So, Franco, magkano yung apples on Friday? Based on the trend, has to be 1 peso. Right? So, why 1 peso? Kasi bumabagsak yung presyo ng 1 peso each day, right? So, you would assume na Friday, it's already 1 peso, right? So, Ganun. Then, just to drive the point, let's look at case 3. Nung Monday, 5 pesos. Tuesday, 6 pesos. Wednesday, 7 pesos. Thursday, 8 pesos. Franco, on Friday, magkano na yung apples? 9 pesos and it's time to take profit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, di ba? So, why? Because you see, tumataas yung presyo ng apples by 1 peso each day, di ba? So, basically, what Franco did is technical analysis. Why? Kasi he's using previous price data to predict the future price data, right? So, ganun yun. So, basically, that's that. Okay. Now, we move on to how this actually looks like. 
sa price charts. Okay, so ito naman ang price chart, right? So these are the complicated charts na from the previous, from the first slide, right? So when it comes to technical analysis, you have three types of trends. So this is the first one. This is what we call the uptrend. What's an uptrend? Basically, uptrend is when prices are going up, diba? The trend is up, diba? Kaya nga uptrend. So uptrend is basically when prices are generally going up. Pero it's easy to say na patas naman yung pressure, right? But how do you define what an uptrend is in a very defined manner, yung objective talaga na uptrend? Like, it's di naman pwede na i-eyeball mo lang na ah, uptrend, di ba? How do you objectively define an uptrend? So, this is how you do it. So, you have a low, di ba? You have a low, you have a high, then, you have another low. Pero yun low, hindi na siya lower than the previous low. Diba? So, ito yung low, previous low. The new low, it's higher than the previous low. So, after that, you need to have a higher high. So, you have a higher high. So, this high is higher than yung previous high na to. Diba? Mas matas siya. So, same... So basically, how you would think of it is para siyang zigzag pattern, you know, zigzag. Diba? Then, ito yung low, ito yung high. Yung low na to, dapat higher than this previous low. Then, itong high, dapat higher than this previous high. Diba? Kung extend mo yan, mas higher to. Then, same thing. Itong low na to, higher than this previous low. Diba? So, that's an uptrend. Basically, pa zigzag. Okay. So, that's an uptrend. So, let's move on to the next trend, type of trend. So, the next trend is downtrend. So, what is a downtrend? It's the trend when prices are go generally going down. Diba? So, visually, you can see na, ay, pababa naman. Right? So, it's a downtrend. But, the same thing, you have to define what a downtrend is objectively. You cannot just eyeball and say na I downtrend yun, right? So how do we do that? We have a high, we have a low, then we have another high. Pero itong high mas mababa na siya than the previous high here, di ba? It's lower than this previous high. So you have a high, low. This is a lower high. After that, you have another low. Pero yung low, mas mababa na than the previous low. Then, same thing, you have a high na mas mababa than the previous high. So, basically, para siyang zigzag rin, pero pababa. Right? Para siyang ganun. So, ito yung high. Itong low. Then, yung high na naman to. Pero it's lower than the previous high. Then you have another low. It's lower than the previous low. Diba? So basta you have that, you have a high, low, lower high, lower low. That's a downtrend. Diba? So, ayun. So, next, we go to the next one. Next one is pa sideways. So, sideways generally have equal highs and lows. So ito, yun high, ka-level niya lang itong high na to, right? Itong high, generally, ka-level lang niya. Same thing, you have a low, di ba? Parang ka-level niya lang, right? So basically, equal, generally equal highs and lows. Di naman kailangan like super exact yun highs. So it's generally an area. So don't think, you don't have to be like, ay, Mas mataas to than this, di ba? So parang, you don't have to do that. Parang estimate lang. So that is a sideways trend. Okay. So how you would visualize this is parang siyang range bound lang. Parang may range siya. Parang ganun lang siya. Parang zigzag, pero hindi siya gumagalaw. 
Then, para siyang may range. So, this is the range. Ito yung upper range. Ito yung lower range. Diba? So, parang ganun. It's stuck in a range. That's a sideways. Diba? Parang up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Ganun lang siya. Okay? So, that is a sideways. So, next. Okay, so the next concept that I want to teach you guys is support and resistance. So, di ba nga, uh, we define yung sideways na generally equal highs and lows. But those generally equal highs and lows, they're also what we call support and resistance. So, support, ito yung support. So, where prices have generally bounced up, di ba? So, parang... Pag nakita mo, kapag tumama yung price dito, sa price na to, tumatalbog siya. Diba? When you see prices go to this level, tumatalbog siya. The same thing, when you see prices go here sa highs, diba? bumabagsak siya. Dito, bumabagsak siya. So, that's support and resistance. How you can interpret it is through an example, right? So here we have what we, we have an example. So let's say, mahilig ako sa coffee. So let's say Starbucks. So let's say I love cafe latte. Okay, so let's say the price is 7.5 pesos around here. So let's say around 7.5 pesos yun kape, di ba? So for me, ako kuripot ako, di ba? So when I say when I see na, oi 7.5 pesos ang kape. Di ako bibili kasi kuripot ako eh, parang masyadong mahal 'yun for me, di ba? So if if kape latte is 7.5 pesos, sasabihin ko, ay, ang mahal naman, di ba? So parang it's major, it's too expensive, I won't buy na. So if there's a lot of people like me na naniniwala na ay, mahal yung 7.5 pesos for a coffee latte. No one's gonna buy, right? And if no one buys, edi eh, may oversupply, di ba? So, binibenta ng Starbucks at 7.5, pero walang bumibili. So, what will happen? Sasabihin ni Starbucks, ay, masyadong mahal ata yung 7.5 pesos. Babaan natin pressure, right? Let's cut the prices. Kasi no one's buying our coffee, right? So, because of that, there's an oversupply, bumabagsak ng presyo, right? Then, let's say, okay, Starbucks, Starbucks says, okay, so if ayaw nila sa 7.5, let's make it 5.5 pesos na lang. So, 5.5 pesos. So, for me, when I saw na, uy, from 7.5, naging 5.5 na lang, I'm like, uy, mura na, di ba? Di ba? So, tara, bili, bili na tayo, right? Let's buy coffee. So if there's a lot of people like me that believe na oy mura na at 5.5 pesos people will start buying diba so when i saw na oy 5.5 pesos sige bili na ako so that means you have demand at 5.5 pesos if you have demand here edi tatas yung presyo why because Starbucks so sina oy ang daming bumibili at 5.5 pesos tasa natin yung presyo diba kasi if there's a lot of people buying at 5.5, if we increase the price to 6, diba, they can make more profit diba? kasi mas matas yung selling price nila. So because of that demand, ayan, tatasan nila yung presyo. So price goes up. So generally, think of it as demand and supply. The resistance is yung supply. Matas yung supply, kaya bumabog sa yung presyo. Then support is the area na maraming demand which price which pushes prices up diba so if i were an investor where would i buy i would buy kapag nasa support then i'll sell kapag nasa resistance right so that's the concept of support and resistance Now, my question to you, Franco, is now that you know about support and resistance, yeah. do you think 
the price will always stay sideways. Parang nasa range lang siya nito. Like no, it just keep going. Yeah, no, it doesn't always consolidate for it can consolidate for years, but then eventually at some point there will be something driving the price that will either break above resistance or break below support. Yes, exactly. So like what I told you, there are three types of market trends. There's uptrend, downtrend, and sideways. And this is one of the trends which is sideways. But the market, it always changes. Di naman pwede always nakatangle ang stock, right? So stocks, they're volatile, right? They can move sideways, they can move up, they can move down. So that's a point. So let's say Diba? Coffee is 7.5 pesos. Let's say may bagong formulation in Starbucks. Let's say yung coffee latte nila mas matamis. Diba? Parang they improve the creamer. Then the price is still 7.5 pesos. So what will people think? Uy! For the same price, I can get a better product. So kung ganun, there will be a lot of buyers here kasi parang, uy, matry nga, di ba? 7.5 pesos. Okay lang kasi may added feature. So because of that, they want to buy higher than 7.5 pesos. And because of that, we have what we call a breakout. <laughs> so what's a breakout? So a breakout is when this resistance is broken. So here, ito yung resistance, di ba, dati? Yeah, no, it pierced through it, diba? It broke through the resistance. So what this means is that and dami talagang buyers na kahit maraming supply dito, they pushed past it, diba? So parang there's enough buying pressure to push it above the supply zone. Diba? So marami talagang gusto bumili ng coffee at 7.5 or even higher, diba? So... Once you have a breakout from a sideways, from a resistance level, usually you should get a transition to an option. But of course, it's not 100%. But in theory, that's what should happen. So once you have a break of resistance, there's a lot of hungry buyers to mata in pressure, right? Then in the same way, paano naman kung price goes below the support. It's also a breakout, or a breakout, pababa, or you can call it a breakdown, right? So it broke support. What this means is, uh, at at 3.2 pesos, parang, ay, medyo umay na ako sa coffee na to. Eh. Parang, di ko na feel mag coffee. Parang, gusto ko milk tea na lang, di ba? I'll go to chat times, I'll buy milk tea, ayoko na ng coffee. So, there's a lack of demand at the support level. What happens kung walang demand at the Starbucks, they'll lower the prices kasi masyadong mahal, di ba? No one's buying it. So they'll lower the prices, di ba? So may, may downshed tayo, di ba? Because there's a lot of, so, there's a lot, there's a lack of demand, di ba? And there's oversupply. So prices go down. So ayun. So next is do support and resistance levels. Diba? We, we showed an example where it worked during a sideways trend. Does that always happen only in a sideways trend? The answer is no. So you can also see support and resistance in an uptrend. So here we have an uptrend, diba? in zigzag, the uptrend tayo. Here you can see na. Here, this is, a, this is a resistance. So you see, diba? once it hit this level, bumagsak siya. Right? But once it went back here, nag-breakout siya. Then where did price bounce from? Diba? So parang once it broke out here, it went back here. So yung previous, yung previous resistance na to, ito resistance, once nag-breakout siya, it went back to the break, previous breakout level. Diba? So, ito, resistance to. Then, once it broke out and it went back to the level, it acted as support. So, what's the logic behind this? So, let's say 
hero. So, this is 13 pesos. If coffee was 13 pesos, and they're like, uy, may bagong formulation, di ba? Let's buy it. Then you saw, naging 14 pesos na yun ko, pe, di ba? Then you saw, uy, nag-sale! It went back to 13 pesos. You're like, uy, di ba dati 14 to? Then now it's back to 13, which was expensive dati. So parang may memory ka na, uy, dati 13 to ah. Then it's back there, di ba? From 14, naging 13. So very memorable yung price na yun, di ba? So what will happen is, there'll be a lot of demand here. Kasi buyers, they remember the prices, di ba? They remember the prices when they were cheap. So they would buy here, then, ayun, the uptrend continues, right? So basically, the former resistance, once it breaks out, price can go back to that level and act as support, diba? So ganun yun. Next. So next is downtrend naman. Do support and resistance work in downtrends? The answer is definitely yes. So how does that work? So ito, here you see that this was support. Say price bounced here, do So here, support. Then once it broke down, it went back here. Magsakulit. So let's say here, 7 pesos, di ba? So from 7 pesos, in coffee, naging 5.8 na lang. Di ba? So... From 5.8, bumalik sa 7 pesos, you're like, uy, di ba dati 7 pesos na yun? Bakit 7 pesos ulit? Di ba? So, kasi you're like, uy, mura na sa 5.8, bumili ka na. Right? 5.8 pesos, you bought coffee. Then, then when it went back to 7 pesos, you're like, uy, bakit mahal ulit? Di ba? It's expensive. So what happens is, same thing, there's oversupply, there's a lack of demand, kumabang sa presyo. Right? So, I want you guys to think of the psychology of the charts. It's not just plotting your support and resistance, but you have to understand the psychology behind it. Why buyers and sellers are reacting to a certain level because of their memory. They, re they, mem they remember those prices, right? That's what causes a reaction. Either it bounces up or down, okay? So... Basically, with that, what's the key takeaway here? We want to buy stocks. We want to find stocks at key levels. And what are those key levels? Those are stocks either at support or stocks at resistance. So why support? Because support, because there's a historical tendency for prices to bounce back up once it hits that level. So this is yun level na nakasale yung coffee, di ba? Kung nakasale yung coffee, di ba, there's a lot of demand kasi people will buy it at discounted prices. Then, here naman, stocks at resistance. Why would we wanna look at stocks at resistance? Di ba nga, ito yung medyo mahal na level, di ba? So, the reason behind this is, what if mag-breakout, di ba? What if people wanna buy higher at higher levels. So that's why, even if the stock is at resistance, you have to watch it because the moment it breaks out, mag-transition na yan into an uptrend, right? But most importantly, you want to find stocks at key levels, either at support or resistance, and in uptrends. So the bigger picture is, pa-uptrend pa rin. Why? Because... It's easier to make money when stocks are going up, right? Is it easy to make money when stocks are going down? No, diba? Mahira. So just buy stocks when the longer term trend is pataas, diba? Because trust me, you'll have an easier time making money if the trend is with you. So ayun. Next slide. So now that we discuss fundamentals and technicals, now, what do you do with the two, right? Or do you side with one na, uy, fundamentals na lang ako. Or, ay, ayoko ng numbers, ayoko ng ganun. Ayaw, I don't want to read the news. Gusto ko technicals lang ako. I just want to look at the charts. The answer is, di pwede. 
it cannot be one side. You have to be both. If you really wanna be uh be a profitable trader, you have to put them together, talaga. So, my rule of thumb is if you found a stock using fundamentals, look at its technicals, no one. Or if you found a stock using technicals, you look into its fundamentals. So, a key takeaway here is that it does not matter if you found the stock using fundamentals first or technicals first. It does not matter. What matters is, okay, I found a stock with good technicals. I'll look into its fundamentals naman if okay rin siya. Or if I found a stock using fundamentals, you look at the charts naman kung may uh, patas ba siya or is there, can you buy it at support? Can you buy it on the breakout? So these two have to go hand in hand because if the stock is good fundamentally, where the trend is babagsak, hindi babagsak pa rin, right? Because the, the, the charts don't lie, di ba? Then, if you, you found a stock na, na, for example, tumataas, pero yung fundamentals, pangin, maybe you should be a bit worried na kasi baka reality comes, uh, people price in yung reality na, ay, pangit talaga. Maka-hype lang yung stock, di ba? So, that's something na you have to be worried about. So, it's better if you combine the two kasi the quality of your stock selection, it's a lot higher. So, at the end of this, you want to look for stocks with fundamental growth drivers and bullish chart formation. So, in fundamentals, okay, check. Diba? In technicals, okay, rin, check. Eddie, better, diba? The two sides of analysis, they agree with each other. So, mas pampante ka na the trade will will have a better probability of going in your favor. Diba? So, ganun lang yan. Okay, next is next is trade planning. So, now that I already taught you uh, in an easy way how to do fundamental analysis, where are you gonna enter? Diba? That's the one thing. So, okay, alam ko na yung breakout Alam ko na yun uh, support, di ba? Alam ko na yun uptrend, downtrend, sideways. So what, di ba? So what? So here is the what. Trade planning. So how are you going to enter using your technical analysis? You only have two entry points. Dalawa lang. Just to keep it very simple. You can either buy on support or buy on breakout. Di ba? So... If ito yung range, diba? Mga ganun, you either buy on support or if you see na parang is gumaganon, it's staying at resistance, you buy the breakout. Diba? So those are the two entry points in support, buy on support or buy on breakout. Dalawa lang. Okay? Then next, where do you place your stop loss if you buy on support? If you buy on support, you place it below support. So, mga dito. Diba? You place your stop loss here. If you're gonna buy on breakout, where do you place your stop loss? Edi dito, below resistance. Right? Then, your target price, you put it at the next major resistance level. So, I'll show you later on, but ito muna. So, next is, market my entry ka na, my stop loss ka na, my target ka na, would you buy the stock na agad? The answer is, it depends talaga. So why? You have to look at your risk to reward ratio. So here is a diagram, di ba? Itong weighing scale. So Franco, which of these sides do you want na mas, which one should be heavier? The risk or the reward? The reward. Less risk. Higher reward. It's always the ideal one. But... So basically, this one, dapat dyan, reward dyan, in risk, dapat dyan lang, right? Right? Yeah, yeah. You always want uh, to maximize the amount of reward you can receive in the trade and minimize the risk. Right? It's true. So basically, you want the risk 
maybe a small portion lang of your account, then you want to gain higher than what you risk, di ba? At least one is the two. What is one is the two? So you risk one to gain two, basically. So let's say Ken dito, di ba? Tataya ka ng isang pochi para kumita ng dalawang pochi, di ba? Right? That's basically it. You're risking losing one so that you can gain two. Yeah, I just want to add, um, when it comes to risk and reward, there's always there's always a trade-off. So when you when there's when you look for a higher reward, you'll always uh, have to um assume a lot more risk. So it's high reward, high risk, lower low reward, lower risk. Yes. Now the main point here is this. Tataya ka ba if alang mong mas malaki ang kaya mong mawala kaysa sa panalunin? Would you, Franco? Yes. No. <laughs> no, di ba? Kasi, what's the point of risking so much just to earn konti lang, di ba? Why would you risk one peso to gain one cent, di ba? It doesn't make sense, right? Of course, if you're gonna risk one peso, you wanna gain two peso, three peso, four peso, di ba? Parang ganun. So, that is your risk to reward. So, let's Visualize it naman sa charts. So, here's an example. So, buy on support naman to. So, here we have a support level. So, why is it a support? So, dito, once it hit around 17.3, diba, tumalbog. Once it went here again, tumalbog. Once it went here again, tumalbog. So that is your support because a lot of people think na mura at 17.3. Kaya siya tumatalbog. Next is you identify your resistance. So for me, this is a resistance around 19.5. As a hero, once it went to 19.5, mumagsak. Once it went to 19.5, mumagsak. So parang maraming sellers at 19.5, right? So that's why once it hits 19.5, prices go down. So if you do that, wait, give it slides. Okay, so here. Okay, so here, if you saw this, okay, let's say, so you buy here, buy on support, where do you put your stop loss below support? So done. Where do you put your take profit at the next resistance dito. Then, remember the risk and reward? How do you measure that? So, katin mo lang to from the entry to your stop loss. Then, you stack it up. Diba? So, marang here. That's 1 is to 1. 1 is to 2. 1 is to 3. One is the four, the boss. So, parang you're risking one to gain one, two, three, four. So, ito four, the boss. So, you're risking one to gain four. So, that is your risk to reward. So, basically, itong entry to stop loss, dapat malit lang yan. Tapos, in reward mo from entry to take profit, mas malaki. So, itong sukat, dapat mas malaki than itong sukat. Right? So, there. So, if you did this, it is, this is your plan. You buy here. Your stop loss dito. Take profit dyan. What will happen? Yun, di ba? <laughs> so, what it, it worked, di ba? So, you bought here. So, mas ngayon presyo. It went to your take profit. Then, ayun, nag red candle, di ba? Uy, genius, di ba? You bought at support, you saw that resistance, di ba? Panalo ka. Right? So, another example, buy and break out naman. So, here, you have a resistance. Why is it resistance? Because here, resistance, 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 resistance. Kasi here, oh, once it hits this level, magsak. It's this level bugs up. It's this level bugs up. So, parang ganun. 
Then now you see na parang, uy, di na siya bumabagsak masyado. So you think na, uy, baka pwedeng breakout to. So your entry is here, the breakout. So around 30 pesos. Your stop loss below resistance. Diyan. Diba? Then your take profit, here. Your risk to reward, you're risking one. Again, one, two, three. Diba? One is the three. You're risking one, gain three. So what happens if you do that? Yun, diba? So you bought here, price went up, then it went here, take profit, diba? Genius na naman, diba? Panalo ka ulit. But, of course, this is a cherry pick chart, diba? So parang, I just made it to drive a point. No? That's what you should be looking for, right? But remember, just because you did your homework doesn't mean uh, the market owes you a win. Because at the end of the day, you're playing the probability game, right? So you're playing the probability that prices will break out and hit your target. You're playing the probability that prices will bounce from support. Diba? Kaya siya may dice. Because you're playing the probability game. So what happens in the in reality, right? So here, example, this is a stock. If you see na, uy, support dito, di ba? You buy on support, ayan, wasak, di ba? You try to buy here, or wala, it went lower, di ba? So once prices hit this, it hits your stop loss. What do you do, Franco, once it hits your stop loss? You got to sell it. Right? So why do we have to sell when it hits our stop loss? Because proper risk management and to cut, to stop the losses. Right. So basically, you got to stop the bleeding, diba? So if you're bleeding, hayaan mo lang ba na tumulo yung blood? Of course not, right? You get a band-aid, you get some gauze, diba? You treat it, my first aid kit ka. That's your stop loss. You, you got to stop the bleeding, diba? Because alam mo nang pabagsak. It broke support. Why are you holding pa, right? It doesn't make sense. Unless you're just hoping uh, to mass which hope is not a strategy, diba? It's really not. So next example. So here, diba? My resistance tayo. So what do you do? Buy on breakout. What happens? Ayun, di ba? It went down. So, it hit your stop loss. Di ba? So, what do you do, Franco, once it hits your stop loss? You sell it again. Right? So, ayun, di ba? From the previous examples, di ba? Panalo ka. Yun naman, talo ka. So, that's the reality of the market. Just be, You cannot win all the time, right? But, the point is, when you win, you win big, di ba? Because you have a risk to reward of at least one is to do, right? So, if you lose... You lose one, but if you win, you win two, three, four, diba? So that's how you will survive when trading. So now let's make an example. So this is a case study. So this is a stock that I traded personally at the end of 2022. So here we have Bloomberry, Bloom. So what are the fundamentals? The fundamentals I saw are... Huge recovery in earnings, so triple digit quarterly net income growth. So, bakit matas yung net income growth ng Bloom? So, that's because of revenge spending on tourism. What do I mean by that? Well, if you look back, diba, we have the pandemic. Then, what happened during the pandemic? Diba, nasa bahay ka lang, diba? you're stuck at home, you can't do anything, you can't go out. You can't go to the cinema, you can't travel, you can't fly out. Diba? Nasa bahay ka lang, diba? You're so bored. So, so, what happens when so so what happens when you're so bored and then finally the government says no more lockdown. You're free to go wherever you want. You can go out. You don't need to wear a mask anymore. What happens, right? People revenge spend. So, uy, di ako makaburakay ng sobrang tagal. 
Now, pwede na. So, what happens? People go to Barakay, they spend, they, they, they travel. So, that is prevent spending. And Bloom was a beneficiary of that because it owns resorts, casinos, mga hotels. Di ba? That's Bloomberry. So, that's the fundamentals that I saw. So, that is the story. Then, an added bonus was potentially it was to be included in the PSEI index based on its market cap and value traded. Then, after the fundamentals, I saw the technicals. It's like, ui, it's trading at 52 week high levels and it's a breakout candidate. So, let's look at the chart. <clears throat> so, this is the chart of Bloomberry. So, we saw a resistance level. So, here, Resistance level, resistance level, right? And now it's near resistance. So since I like the story of Bloomberry, I saw the recovery, and I think that a lot of people will really pour money into the resorts, into the casinos of Bloomberry. I saw that it's a breakout. Uh, it's a breakout uh, opportunity, right? So here... So I had my entry here, my stop loss below resistance, and my target at the next resistance, right? So what happened next? Boom, <laughs> right? So this was a winning trade for me. So once it broke out, it just rallied up, hit my resistance. Once it hit my resistance, I sold now, then price drop. Okay. So this was my result. So here, this is a fast trade, so it was seven days. So there I bought at the breakout, bought 7.77, and I sold 8.95. So there. So just to wrap it up. This is the process, this is the workflow you need to do when crafting your watch list. First is to do your own research, right? Check the fundamentals and technicals, right? Do you like the story? Do you like the financials of the company? Next, is it at support? Is it at resistance? Are you going to buy on support? Are you going to buy on breakout? Is it in an uptrend, right? So these are things that you consider. Then after that, you put it in your watch list, right? Once it's in your watch list, you go to your technicals, you plot your support and resistance, right? Then your trade plan. Your trade plan is determining your entry, stop loss, and make profit. So this is the workflow that you need to master so that you can build an effective watch list. And you know, you have your trade plan, right? Then what's left next would be to execute the trade, right? But that's another topic for a different day, right? So this is first your watch list. Yeah, and I just want to add, um, for all our uh, Dragonfly account holders, and we do send um, weekly newsletters and charts, uh, charts and focus where um, Jared and I, we send out our, our analysis of stocks and um, we give out updates on bullpen updates as well. And that's what that's a way to supplement your uh, trading journey. And if you don't have a Dragonfly account, you can definitely open one and start receiving our weekly newsletters. Yes, exactly. So there you'll see some of our trade ideas that if you like, then maybe you could add it to your watch list, right? So there you go. <laughs> So that wraps up my talk, and I guess we're open to questions, right, Franco? Yeah, great work, Jared. Thank you so much for teaching us about technical analysis, watch this, and how to plan our trades. Uh, so now it's time for the Q&A portion. So if you have questions, please uh, send them in the chat box or in the comment section, and we'll do our best to answer them all. All right, so the first question is, how do you avoid false breakouts? OK, <laughs> this is very close to my heart because I'm a breakout trader, so I experienced a lot of false breakouts in all of my trades. So 
be honest, there's really no way to avoid it unless until yeah you actually experience it. So when you're trying to buy a breakout, you, you really don't know if it will push up and start an uptrend or it will hit your cut loss, right? You really don't know. And there's really no way to avoid it. But I guess a way for you to protect yourself is to have your stop loss in place. So as I said, you're playing the probability game, right? You're rolling a dice. And sometimes the, the odds just don't go in your favor, right? So when that happens, you should have your protective stop loss below so below resistance so that if it is a false breakout and it hits your stop loss, you should be out already and you minimize your losses. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Risk management is such an important thing when it comes to uh, trading something like a breakout, especially for those who recently saw Aboitis Powers attempt to break its resistance level. Uh, during the start of the day, it actually broke out and uh, reached the, uh, it uh, extended its uh, candlestick, but during the half of the day after lunch, it faded away despite the heavy volume because of all the selling pressure. So uh, that's an indication that the breakout has failed if, if it cannot sustain its upward momentum. All right, uh, next question. Uh, which do you prefer, buy on breakout or buy on support? So I already answered this. So I prefer buy on breakout. Now, why buy on breakout? Because there tends to be a lot more momentum on the breakout rather than buying on support. So when you're buying on breakouts, there's a lot of pent up demand because prices have been hit have been hitting resistance again and again. And once you see that sellers, that buyer, when you see that sellers don't want to sell as much anymore, and you see that buyers they don't want to buy at lower prices anymore, and you see that prices are just staying at resistance, they're just consolidating tightly at resistance. Then for me, there's that just means that there's a lot of pent up demand, and I want to take advantage of that by buying the breakout because usually the follow the if buyers do push through, right, the momentum is really fast. It can prices can go up really fast during the breakout. But when I buy on support, personally, I find that it takes a very long time for prices to go into my favor. So just because of that, I prefer to buy on breakouts, to buy on breakout rather than support. How about you, Franco? Uh, personally, it, for me, it kind of depends. Uh, it depends on how the market's going, what's the environment like. Like uh, in the US, for example, with the recent tech uh, rally, uh, I, usually I usually buy on the breakouts. And then uh, for some, uh, for like the Philippine market, like a few years ago, where we've been trading sideways for a while, I usually buy on support just to minimize my risk and uh, sell on the resistance level. So I'd say it um, it depends on the market condition. I always try to follow the overall market trend and before um, to determine if whether or not I'm going to buy on support or breakout. Yeah, that's a good point. So it really depends what setups you see. If you see yeah. that they're all buy and support, then that's all you can trade, right? But if you see that the market's really strong and everything's breaking out, then you won't find buy and support setups, right? You'll only see buy and break out. So that's true. It really depends on the market condition. All right. Uh, time for the next question. Do you trade stocks with no fundamental drivers but has good technicals? Okay, so this is very dear to me too. So sometimes, yes, uh, I do sometimes. But I really have to caution that it's not for everyone. So these are what you call your basura stocks, right? Basura. <laughs> yeah. So these are stocks that suddenly from being super illiquid, you see that they suddenly jump up with good volume. And for me, sometimes you can take advantage of it for a short period of time and see like one like very fast uh, uptick. But for those, you just have to get out really fast. Like it's not so it's not a kind of trade where you're gonna hold it for the bagger. It's a stock where once you buy it, you gotta sell immediately once it already goes up, right? Because these are the stocks prone to profit taking and they can die down really fast. But for me, if you really want to be uh, consistent as a trader, uh, you should not rely on these kinds of setups because they just happen like 
uh, like once in a blue moon. But if I were you, if you really want consistency in this game of trading, go with the stocks with fundamental drivers and good technicals because those are just way higher probability. How about you, Franco? Yeah, uh, I also agree with you there. Um, I always for the long uh, for the all for the longest time, I always tried. Uh, I always trade with uh with a, ba a fundamental basis and then with the good technicals because that really helps me minimize the downside risk that. That that can happen in a stock. And if but if I do, but there are instances before where I traded purely on technicals, but that was completely speculative. And I've always just traded that in the short term. So but it's very it's I would recommend that you mix fundamental drivers with good technicals. So that way you can mac you can maximize the upside potential of your investment. All right. Um next question. So um, I bought a blue chip stock. However, it went below my stop loss price. Can I just hold it for the long term? Okay. So I guess based on these questions, initially you were supposed to trade this stock, but it went below your stop loss and you did not sell. So maybe you were like, ah, baka tatas pa yan, right? Then once it went even lower, you're like, eh, yung hanay ko, di ba? Parang, eh, blue chip naman, right? So Again, I think a lot of uh, beginner traders go through this. And the solution is really to think back to why you took the trade. If you took it as a trade where you have a defined entry point, you have a defined take profit, and you have a defined uh, stop loss, then once it hits your stop loss, you got to sell, right? doesn't matter if it's a blue chip, right? doesn't matter what kind of stock it is. Even if it's a blue chip, right? A blue chip at the wrong time, still a bad it's still a bad stock right just because it's a blue chip doesn't mean it's forever gonna go up right there are there are periods where blue chips will go down and they're just not a good stock to hold at that time right so for this if you believe that um it your initial your initial idea for the trade has been invalidated then you gotta cut right so for me i will just cut it because the objective was for a trade and it really wasn't for long term. How about you, Franco? Um, I there's also another approach to it. If if your um a, if your initial investment on the blue chip was for the long term because you did believe in the growth potential and the fundamental value of that stock and you you really believe in it and your investment thesis still holds true, um then um it's possible to you can you can definitely hold it, especially if the reason why the price has gone below your stop loss is not because of, of fundamentals, but because of like more macroeconomic environment. Like during the pandemic, when all the stocks all um, were trading at a discounted price for so long, that's I'd say that would be an, a, a very an opportune time to apply like the peso cost average if your investment horizon is very long term. But also going back to what uh, Jared said, um. If you ex if you ex trade with a trading plan, always follow it. It should never have gone below your stop loss, because that um because you always have to follow your risk management. So, if your approach to it is short term, then you definitely have to follow your stop loss price. But if it's for the long term, then if the investment thesis or if your belief in the stock still holds true with good fundamentals, then you can still hold it, and wait for an opportune time to either sell it or or continue holding it, especially when it comes to a dividend stock. Okay, um, next question, please. How do we identify trend reversals, like uh, an uptrend shifting to the downtrend and vice versa? Because it's sometimes scary to just ride an uptrend and baka maipit ka na ma na ma pala sa pataas. Okay. So how do you identify trend reversals? So a good example is going back to the definition of an uptrend, right? So I will draw. So this is an uptrend. It's an uptrend as long as it's making uh, higher highs and higher lows, right? Higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows, right? So as long as it's doing that, it's still in, a, in an uptrend. So when will the trend reverse? Once you see that, oops, 
right? So what happened here? You have a higher high. This is a higher low, but you got a lower high, right? So this high, it did not exceed the previous high. So once you see that, that's, our, that's already a warning signal that, okay, they should be making another high, but it did not, right? So that could caution you already to think twice about it. And the confirmation is if it breaks this low, it makes another low, then that's already your exit point because that's a trend reversal. So why is this a downtrend? Well, so you have a high, low, lower high, and a lower low. So that's a downtrend. So that's a trend reversal. So if you're going to exit a downtrend, uh, you exit here. Because the break of this low is the confirmation of a downtrend. Then here, if we continue, it looks scary to ride a downtrend. Baka maipit ka pala sa taas. Well, to be honest, you really don't know. Eh? Like, because stocks, they can go up more than you can imagine, right? Sometimes you thought, ay, expensive na pala. It goes even higher, right? So, there's just no way to tell talaga. Unless you use your valuation, right? If you see that it's trading way above fair value, that maybe that can aid in uh, trying to determine if it's a bit of a topish. But if you're just following price, you really won't know until you get this formation, right? Then when you do, you exit here. How about you, Franco? Oh, no, you just, you you perfectly explained it. Yeah, that's how it usually goes. All right, um, next question, please. How how many higher highs and higher lows should be ident should be identified for the uptrend to be considered an uptrend? Okay, how many higher highs and higher lows? So you generally only need one one set of it. So here, once you see a break of this, that's an uptrend. That's it. Uptrend again. But I do understand that sometimes the first uptrend you can be a bit spec uh skeptical because if you look at the bigger picture, it's still in a downtrend. So parang pagadun pa siya. Then this is the, the first set. So you can say that okay, this is an uptrend here. Pero if you look here, parang pa downtrend pa siya, right? So that's something that uh it's really up to preference. But for me. As long as I like the stock and then it does this, it makes a higher high. That's an option now for me. But if you think that there's a re it's not really a good stock and you think that it's still a downtrend in a bigger picture, then that's up to your interpretation. So that's where you combine the fundamentals and technicals, right? So of course, the bigger picture is still downtrend. But if you really like a company, and it makes the first uptrend in a, from a downtrend, that's usually the best times to buy, especially if they really reverse upwards. Uh, how about you, Franco? Oh, no, yeah, that, that's perfectly explained, Jared, yeah. Okay. Uh, th thank you for that question. Uh, next question, please. Next question, please. If the stock is on an all-time high, where will you put take profit? And also, is, is it safe to trade when a stock is, an, is on an all-time high? Okay, so that's a really good question. So there are some ways to do it. So let's say the stock is in a range. Then this is the all-time high. Oh, that's your A, B, H. Okay, so... If it breaks out, where will you set your TP? So um, you measure this. From, so if it's from a sideways base, you measure, you measure this. You measure this, and then you stack it on top. So this, the length of the base, you stack it on top. That's your TP. That's, yeah. But if it just keeps going up, what we usually do is, we trail our stops using a moving average. So a moving average, it's basically the average price of the stock for how many days. So usually that will just follow price. And when price goes below it, that's where you sell. 
So yeah, those are the ways to take profit during an all-time high stock. Um, also, when uh, so as a, a example of a stock like this is like Nvidia, right? If you look at the chart recently, it's been going up for a really long time, um, because of the AI, because of AI. So um, when it comes to stocks like this, you all, you you I would prefer trading the breakout. Um, and there's always a setup when it comes to uh, an uptrend, especially you can, for example, you can buy on the on the break of the previous day's candle. And then if, if the breakout doesn't hold, your stop loss would be on the previous day's low. And it's never completely safe to trade a stock on because on a, when it's on an all-time high, right? Because there's always risk associated with it. Um, but you have, for a stock like NVIDIA, and you, it, the reason why it's going up so high is because it's contribution to the AI trend. So macro, uh, like a, an industry trend like that is, is strong enough to push the stock even higher because it it um it reflects on the company's fundamentals. Like recently, um, Nvidia beat expectations in its earnings because of all its um revenue sales when it comes to chips and AI related uh, business. Yeah. Uh, next question. How to trade stocks that are an all time high? So this uh, we uh, answer this question. So yeah. Now next question, please. Uh, for dividend investors, when do we consider doing stop losses or how do we place cut loss? Example, on REITs and other dividend paying stocks, I mean, the strategy is long term, yes, but how do we minimize losses? Just average down? Uh, I think Franco is better suited to answer this. Uh, so when it comes to dividend paying stocks and REITs, I know a lot of people like REITs and they're like eight REITs now, but when it comes to uh, making an investment for the long term, I think fundamentals play a long, a very important role when it comes to this type of investment. Uh, so, for example, I've we're doing research on REITs right now, and based on what I've seen, uh, there are only a few REITs that are really worth uh, holding because you, you they have strong um, um, property acquisitions, they have um, good fundamentals, they have growing dividends, which is such an important factor to a dividend paying stock or something like a REIT, right? So in the long term, um, when you have, like, for example, the recent private placement of a REIT, the best, uh, because fundamentally it's good, someone's just acquiring shares, you'd want to average down on that. And um, when it comes to doing stop losses, um, usually um, at, the initial, at the start of your investment, your stop loss is basically on, or generally below support. But as the trend goes up, you can put your stop losses um, below a moving average or previous um, support. But thinking long-term, you wouldn't do this unless the stock has fundamentally changed, the dividends are falling, um, it's facing some regulatory issues. That's when you want to sell a long-term investment. I hope that answers your question. Um, next question, please. What if lumipad na po yung stock uh, and hindi ako na, nakapasok sa buy below price ko? Bye bye stock na bao and move on along like MWC. Okay, so if you uh, you have to wait for the next setup, right? So if price consolidates and makes another sideways trend, then you buy the the next breakout, right? But unless there is a setup, if there's no setup like what it didn't bounce off support or it didn't make another breakout, then um well you just have to wait right so trading is really a waiting game right so you have to wait you need to have the discipline to wait for the stock to either hit support and bounce or break out of resistance so it's really the discipline if there's no setup you don't execute okay so the next question is um is there futures trading i think on Dragonfly, um, the answer is no. We there's no futures trading right now. Um, next, uh, next. Let's move on to the next question. What is the best technical uh technical indicators you are using? Okay, so indicator, the number one is volume. So uh, why volume? Because volume is <clears throat> volume is basically like the gas tank of a car, right? So if you don't Fill up the gas. 
then how can the how can the car go up right how can it push forward right so during breakouts you want to see a breakout with volume right because volume is like the the gas tank right if it's not filled then it cannot go up right so the best indicator is really volume how about you franco um yeah and volume is a good indicator but i also use moving averages and rsi uh i've been using that for a long time it always helps uh helps me um identify supports especially moving up uh, moving in an uptrend but there are a lot of indicators you can use like the stochastics um bollinger bands and the macd it's it really depends on your trading style and what you want to use all right uh next question how can traders ensure profitable breakout trades in a market where everyone knows about breakouts? I assume many people would take profit before it hits resistance to outsmart others. Uh, stop losses. That's the only way uh, you'll survive. So you really don't know if it will be a false breakout until it happens, right? But, but for there... me... Oh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. For me, like, I think it's better the more people know of a breakout and they're watching the resistance level, the more you have herd mentality when <clears throat> daming traders na sasabay sa yo sa breakout, right? So that pushes up demand. So if more people know about the breakout, then for me, that's even better because it drives more demand at the breakout. Pero as I said, di po naman alam eh, di ba? You never know if buguhusan ka, right? In played sense, right? So that's why dapat may stop loss ka. Kasi at the end of the day, you're rolling a dice, di ba? So, ganun talaga, right? You just have to play your stop loss and then roll the dice. Uh, there's also, um, um, it also depends on, okay, so for example, before, there, there was a stock that consolidated for like, let's say two years, volume was low, it's been trading sideways, hitting support resistance in a sideways pattern. And then suddenly, there's a spike in volume and a huge um, green candle, right? That usually has a high probability of, of having a su successful breakout, especially if the reason behind that move is based on a catalyst or news event or fundamental change in the company. So when you identify a stock that's been consolidating for a really long time and has a sudden breakout, the probability of that breakout you know, being successful is higher than if, if, a vol if it's a volatile stock with, with a shorter um, consolidation period. Um, next, let's move on to the next question. Do you use multiple time frames to plot your support and resistance? Okay, so I mostly use the daily time frame because that's the most common time frame. But I do sometimes go to the weekly chart to see the clearer picture. So sometimes I do use the the weekly chart, but generally it's the daily and the weekly. Like I don't go down to the one hour, the five minute, the intraday. So for me, it's a bit messier since you get a lot of levels which may not be as important. So I would always stick to the daily and the weekly charts for plotting my supported resistance. Um, next, the next question is: Bakit po nangyari yung gap ups and gap downs, and when do we expect them to happen? Okay, so gap ups are when in price it it opens higher than in previous uh, day's price. So why does this happen? So baka by disclosure, right? So let's say there's a new product in the company and medyo patok, diba? So that will gap it up. Or in the, in the US, there's a lot of earnings report, the uh, earnings beat, right? So when, when you see an earnings beat before the market open, so during the market open, you'll see the gap up ng malaki. So it can be any other fundamental catalyst. So the most common is earnings or a, a disclosure. Maybe there's an acquisition. So it's really a major company event that causes the gap ups. Same same way with the gap down. So if pangit earnings, diba, earnings are lower than expected, you might see a gap down diba, so open. Or there's really a bad news, like there's a lawsuit, then you might see a gap down. So it's something like that. Yeah, normally um, the reason behind gap ups and gap downs, there's always like a fundamental driver to it on on, on most cases, yeah. Uh, let's, let's go to the next question. Uh, 
Uh, next question. Is it fine to place orders even if malayo pa yung price? Like place an order on the support price or should I place it in funds or other investment vehicles? Okay, so if you just leave your order on support, so I personally would not. So I would like to see that price goes down to the level and then I see a small uptick. So by parang it goes down to the support and then my green candle muna. Because I want to see na my reaction to support level. So I wouldn't just leave my price at support level. So gusto ko my, my reaction to that, parang my small bounce. Then once I see that, I would place my buy ready. How about you, Franco? Um, I think if you're like if you're not actively trading or if like you have a job a full time job and you can't always watch the market, then you can and you believe that the price will go back down to the support level. Then you can put a limit order so that when you're away from the market and that stock price hits the uh, hits the support price that you want to buy it at, then your order is executed. But and when it comes to like uh, placing it in funds or in on another investment vehicle, if if you if you believe that you know, there's no much not much trading activity and you believe you you won't be investing in the uh, in the short in the near term, then I would recommend putting your funds in one, uh, your your available cash in funds like a money market fund or any of the funds available so that your cash on hand will earn a bit of interest while you wait for your next investment opportunities. And luckily, Dragonfly does um, offer that type of investment strategy. So with the Dragonfly account, you can um, put your cash in a, in a money market fund or any of the funds we have available, and then you can redeem it once you have found a new trading idea. Yeah, uh, just to add, um, if you follow our investing club portfolio, we actually placed uh, some of our cash into the money market fund of Manulife while we were waiting for our next trade. So that's something that we have actually been doing in the investing club. Yeah. And something that we can recommend to you guys. All right. uh, next question. Please do a fundamental analysis example, maybe next webinar. And I know t technical analysis, but don't know where to start in fundamental analysis. Jared? Um, yes, sure. And then Franco <laughs> can be the speaker, right? <laughs> Um, but in, for fundamental analysis, we will be really, we do have educational articles on that on our uh, platform, and soon we'll have more coming out. So please stay tuned for that. Um, but if you really want to start now, yeah, so you can check out our Dragonfly website uh, for edu educational articles. But if you believe that's um, not enough, then you can definitely um, Google uh, search online for uh, educational articles on. A fundamental analysis. Next, let's go to the next question. What is your recommendation for people entering the stock market to be an investor or to be a trader? The answer is both. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so I believe that everyone should be an investor. Like you should have a long-term dividend portfolio or long-term portfolio, but I think that being a trader, it's not for everyone, but I think that if you learn about it, like it's really going to be a very powerful tool. So, so for example, what I do is I'm both a dividend investor and a short-term trader. Right? So what I would do is uh, when I make my gains in my short-term trades, I would get some of the profits, then I put it into my dividend portfolio, then that's where... That's how it goes. So I trade, and if I profit, I put some of the profit into my dividend portfolio, then I grow that. So for me, it's better if you're both, but uh, generally trading is not for everyone. So don't get me wrong. Like you, I would recommend that everyone learn about it, but it's really not for everyone. But one, one thing that you must have is to be an investor. You should have a long-term portfolio for your return. How about you, Franco? Um, well, to, just to share, I started off as uh, an investor. So that one, that that approach helped me you know, learn fundamental analysis and technical analysis at the same time, because I've seen um, if you start as a trader and you're not confident in what you've done and what you've learned and what you do, there's a higher chance that you would sustain losses because as an investor, you treat it as a business. 
uh, you're treating it as um, a long-term thing. You're doing your research. You're um, being more risk averse as compared to being an active trader where you're trading for the short term, trying to squeeze out profits everywhere you can, right? So just to start, be, uh, I think it would be best to start as an investor because that way you really, you'll force yourself to learn about the fundamental side and the technical side of things. Uh, unfortunately, that is the last question we can uh, answer today, uh, tonight. But for all those um, questions unanswered, please um, don't hesitate to re reach out to us. So, and then we will get back to uh, your questions as soon as possible. So a massive thank you to everyone who tuned in today. And we're just getting started because today was just part one of our three-part web webinar series. So there's a lot more excitement here. Our next webinar is on March 14, which will be how to execute your trades. It will be uh, at 5 p.m. And we have our third one on March 22, which will, all, will be about how to improve your trading. So please make sure to save the date, invite your friends and family to join so that more people can learn how to trade stocks. And if you really, if you want to get started, please um, check out our website and open an account so you can uh, begin your trading uh, journey already. Links to where you can register uh, will be posted after this webinar, but you can also scan the QR code on the screen before you. Uh, for all things stocks and trades, don't forget to like our Facebook page and join our Facebook group. If you have any questions about today's webinars or uh, questions we weren't able to answer, please send us an email at investingclub at dragonfly.ph and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. This concludes our webinar for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you on March 14. Thank you. Bye.